Welcome back to Classical Christian Thought. This is your host, Eric Ibarra. I first want to start off by expressing my gratitude for all those of you who have listened to my previous episodes and have subscribed to my channel. I have received about 200 subscribers in the last two weeks, and that's a lot to ask for, so I thank you. I'm not necessarily looking to get too big, but obviously the more listeners, the more subscribers, the better. And um, I also want the listeners to know that the goal here is not for me to get behind a screen to tell people how much I know. I have a lot to learn. The, 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 the vision that I have here is very close to the vision that is in uh, Reason and Theology with Michael Lofton, which is, you know, his, the title of his show just gives it away, just Reason and Theology. It's, it's a show dedicated to a wide breadth of, of discussion. Mine's called classical Christian thought, and um, I, you know, I always thought that the best way to learn is to have many minds interacting with each other, and so getting behind a screen here is not just me just sort of getting on a pedestal to try and tell everybody how much I know. I also want others to listen to me and give me their feedback, give me their objections, give me some constructive criticism, and. Um, you know, perhaps there are people who have questions and in, inquiries into Christianity and in, in, into Catholicism, and I can be here to help you. But there are those who are also um, they may have they may be a few moves ahead of me on the on the chessboard, and so they could listen to this and say, Ah, okay, Eric said that, but he's mistaken, and here's why. I really want that. I really want that. So this is uh, this is the you know the the vision I have, and uh, I want a platform where we can discuss all things related to Christian thought, and uh, and, and so please if you, if you, if that interests you and and you're you're uh, you're benefiting from what you hear, please subscribe and share with others about this. So this is going to be part two of a series that I'm doing, um, charting my intellectual journey out of Protestantism into Catholicism. And the first episode I did just recently, it's called How I Began to Question Protestantism. If you haven't listened to that one, go back and listen to it. I'll recap the, you know, the summary uh, now. So back in 2006, 2007, I had run into a situation at my local Reformed Baptist church where I came on the radar for a possible heresy trial over the issue of justification. Now the Reformed Baptist Church it holds to the uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, which if those you know those of you are familiar know that it it clearly teaches that the doctrine of justification, uh, echoing p pretty much all the other classical Reformed confessions, is done by an act of imputation. So a believer in Christ, a human being who who believes in Christ, is justified by an act of imputation. Your sins are imputed to Christ. His righteousness is imputed to you. Think of it this way. In, in the heavenly realm, there's, there's a courtroom. And in your file cabinet, in, in the heavenly courtroom, you've got all your sins, like a huge rap sheet, you know, three miles long if you unrolled it all. And uh, God comes and opens the drawer and takes out your rap sheet and puts it in the rap sheet of Christ. And so now Christ is interpreted by God as living a life of sin. And then he takes out the original rap sheet of Christ, which is nothing but pure righteousness and holy deeds throughout his whole life, and puts that in your, uh, your folder. And so the drawers are closed and Christ goes to death row and then you deserve everlasting glory because you're interpreted, you're calculated by God as having lived a perfect life. And, I, you know, that doctrine is just, um, it's not the clearest doctrine uh, in Scripture. And um, many, many, many uh, theologians are now coming to understand that. So, for example, uh, Douglas Moo, who's actually a, uh, he's a top-notch evangelical scholar on the conservative side. Um, he's been defending the traditional understanding of, uh, you know, Protestant justification in the face of the new perspectives that have been coming out since the 70s. And, he, and he, even he said, I quote him, he says, I'm not convinced any New Testament text on its own leads to this doctrine of the imputation 
of the righteousness of Christ. Close quote. I'll put a link to where he said that. You can actually watch the whole video uh, of his lecture. D.A. Carson as well. He's another, um, he's another top-notch evangelical exegete. And if he, it, when he was asked, do you think that the New Testament teaches uh, the doctrine of imputation? He doesn't answer in an emphatically clear way. Now, I'll put a link to his answer as well so you can see where this, this specific aspect of the um, imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer um, it's nowhere clearly stated in scripture and so I came to um, follow the advice of the elders at that Reformed Baptist Church which was you know sola scriptura you got to study scripture for yourself and you know obviously use others as guides you use history um, church fathers you use confessions but ultimately you learn the Koine Greek you come to see if the scripture is teaching X, Y, Z, and then it's been validated. So with with all those admonitions, and you know, they all relinquish themselves of any divine authority. The pastor, all the elders, just you know, no, all of our authority comes from the word of God. And so, you know, they they taught us Greek, they put us in the books to study Bill Mounts' guides to study Koine Greek. Um, they gave us all this literature from the Puritans, all these commentaries from the Reformation times, um, all the way up to this day. And over the years, I just studied and studied and studied, and I came to a different conclusion about the doctrine of justification. I came to see it as um, only the non-imputation of sin. In other words, when Christ dies on the cross for my sins, he blots out all of my iniquity. And so on the day of judgment, I'm going to show up and I'm going to have a clean slate. And so I'll pass the final judgment and I'll be able to be issued into the kingdom of God. So that's the position I took. And the church I was at, um, that Reformed Baptist Church, thought that that was um, only half of the mechanic for justification. That was just the negative aspect. You need the positive aspect, which is, you might be sinless, but then you need a perfect life of righteousness to to you know to enter into everlasting glory, and uh, um, so that you know they led me to a prestigious seminary to help me work out of my heresy, um, and the head of the New Testament department there, um, as I said in the previous video, um, he told me not only did he agree with my view, but he wrote his dissertation defending my view, <laughs> so that was. Uh, interesting but so the final wrap-up of that was that the the, the baptist church had to uh, make an adjustment as to what they understood is uh, an essential doctrine versus a non-essential doctrine and so they used to think that you know the, the 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 positive aspect and the negative aspect had to be there confessionally for somebody to be a christian and and as a result of this you know new testament uh, uh department head at one of the seminaries that our church revered greatly um, turned the tides of the disciplinary procedure at, at this local Baptist church. What I learned from that was that um, it, they were trying to be faithful. You know, that's one thing that um, I'll give this Baptist church, and I'll give it many things. I love the people there. They're, they're fantastic Christians. Um, I don't have any communication with them anymore, but... Um, I have nothing but good things to say other than the things that I would obviously criticize. Um, by the way, I should recommend um, a book if you want to get more into the doctrine of the reform doctrine of justification. There's many books out there, but I found this one to be uh, an easy read. You could probably finish it in a, in a day, really. This is by Thomas Schreiner. He's a, a reformed Baptist scholar is a professor at uh at uh um where is he now he's uh he's still at the southern baptist theological seminary in louisville okay um i i've had uh the privilege of reading many of his works um over the years i think i had email correspondence with him way back in the day when i was uh you know uh, wrestling with these issues um, but the Reformed Baptist Church I went to would definitely be in, on board with, with this understanding of the uh, classical Reformed doctrine.
But in any case, what I learned from this is that um, the sola scriptura paradigm can really cause problems in a local uh, Protestant uh, setting because you've got this dilemma. The elders want to point to the word as the validation source. This is the source of validation. This is the source of legitimacy. This is the sole source of authority, uh, infallible authority. And um, then when you perhaps go into the Bible um, and read uh, for yourself what it teaches, and you start to learn the original languages, read commentaries, study debates in history, and you start to you know, carve out your little theological craft. By the way, this is, I still have my John MacArthur Study Bible. Um, I love, I, I've never gotten rid of it. I love it. I like the New King James Version. Um, so in any case, you, you've got this this uh, desire to be, um, you know, uh, faithful to the word. And, and you know, the, the elders at a Baptist church are not going to say that, they have they've been a divinely appointed or ordained and that they're infallible and that their word has to be listened to and at the same time the new testament itself teaches that the local church has to be authoritative um there you know for example if you go to the book of hebrews chapter 13 um and uh i'll read for you out of my new king james version hebrews 13 verse 17 uh we get an admonish we, we get admonished from i believe paul wrote hebrews but uh we get this this statement here in hebrews 13 verse 7 obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as though as those who must give an account well this is an infallible book or rather, this is an inerrant book that was written by infallible men that were led by the Spirit of God. And it's telling us that there are those who rule over us. So there's a subgroup of people within the local setting that rule over the members and that we are to submit to them. You know, if, um, those of you who are familiar with Matthew 18, we get something similar where there's a situation where you have a wayward member in the community, and if he um, sins or breaks a commandment of Christ, um, he is to be dealt with in in love and um, in charity, but um, he's to be confronted. And if he doesn't listen to the church, we're told in Matthew 18, verse uh, 17, uh, and if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you a heathen and a tax collector, which means somebody who's outside the, 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 the community of faith. Again, I say to you that if two, or, two of you agree on earth concerning anything, two or more, uh, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And just before that, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You know, a lot of Catholics uh, aren't aware, but Protestant, a lot of Protestant uh, communities, um, they take that, that verse very seriously, binding and loosing powers. And, um, of course, they define it in a way that's, you know, um, understood under the economy of sola scriptura. But nonetheless, the New Testament itself, like we had just read from Hebrews and Matthew, the New Testament itself teaches that there's a subgroup in the community that's supposed to stand and confront the rest um, with this possession of the right to um, activate ecclesiastical discipline, if need be. Because as we know from the gospel itself, it's not just a, um, a, you know, a suggestion. The gospel's a, a, a command. You know, Acts 17, Paul says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Mark 16, Christ says, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. So you've got this law of condemnation that, hand, that hangs over the head of those who do not believe or those who believe and then fail to continue to believe. 
And so whether we like it or not, if, if you're in the gospel business, and I hate to use that word, but if you're in the gospel, um, if, you're, if you're in this territory of preaching the gospel, uh, planting churches, you're, you're inevitably going to be involved in ecclesiastical discipline. And, and, and that's because the New Testament um, says that there is a chair for ecclesiastical discipline. The binding and loosing powers of the local church. Hebrews 13 says that there are those who rule over. Um, uh, Paul gives commands to Timothy, imperatives to, uh, to uh, teach, exhort, rebuke with all long suffering. Uh, so you've got all these teachings in the New Testament. We haven't even scratched the surface where the, the local body has to use discernment to make decisions that involve coercive conscience binding authority on their members and sometimes it's not easy to know if that discernment is strictly from scripture if it's adding to scripture if it's their personal interpretation of scripture mixed in with their understanding of the moral principles of the new testament so inevitably you get a a, a lot of local churches uh, protestant churches who who believe in church discipline they struggle with this because sometimes those who they're disciplining will say, well, that's not in Scripture, or that's not clear from my reading of the Bible, like in my situation. And so they can, you know, um, they, 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 there's this, this duality where this, you know, they want to put, invest every, every infallible authority only in Scripture, but then that infallible Scripture enthrones um, pastors to discipline and to make decisions that are conscience binding on their on their on the flock and so there's this tension as to how to you know work through that and uh, books have been written on this it you know Protestants are not new to this they've been studying it for a very long time um, I actually think that in theory some of these Protestant uh, works of scholarship on that matter are actually quite good but um, uh, you know, at my local Baptist church, I, I, I saw that a lot of people who were excommunicated, um, you know, they didn't listen to the church. So eventually that they got thrown out um, and, ex, you know, shunned and um, like First Corinthians chapter uh, five teaches from Paul to the Corinthian church, you know, uh, the evil man is removed from among you or, you know, to cast such a one to uh, the, the power of Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Um, I witnessed that quite a bit. And um, one of the things I saw happening from a lot of these excommunicants is that they would just go to a different Baptist church. And at that Baptist church, the pastor would say, well, I disagree with your old pastor. I think that he's a little... Uh, going a little bit beyond what scripture says and so it, it seems to me like there's there's something more of like a cultic um, cultish element there and um, you know so we'll we'll accept you with open arms well what would happen in that case is you'd have you know a local baptist church saying well we've used the keys to bind this person you can't just unlock the gates of heaven for them where you're at that person has to come back to where he was adjudicated uh, as impenitent and deal with us because the script Matthew 18 says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Um, and so you, you, it's difficult to know. And so the, the, a person just kind of has to say, well, you know, the Baptist churches all have an idea of what is right and what the gospel is, but they're not always going to be correct and so um, people started to exercise their own private judgment on whether it was legitimate to leave and just join another church or um, you know or they'd come back to that Baptist church and submit to the penance we, th there was actually penances you know you'd, at, at least a year you'd have to go through of uh, you know some very strict instructions outside of the church before you could be allowed back in and uh, so that led me to study history. You know, it led me to go back and see, okay, this just doesn't sound right. You know, 
I don't buy the excuse of just leaving the church and going to another church where another pastor can talk me into thinking that our pastor was wrong. Because doesn't the New Testament equip the local church with authority? I mean, it's very clear in the New Testament. So if we could just sort of say, well, yeah, that the New Testament says that, but they're not infallible. So um, I, you know, I'm going to use my own discernment and I choose this other Reformed Baptist church or this other Presbyterian church or this other Methodist church. And, you know, we all agree on the essentials. Yes, they excommunicated me. But you know what? They're not infallible, and the issue is not an, an essential issue. So you know, I went to another church where they accepted me. They didn't think I was violating the essence of the of the gospel, and you know, we're all happy in the end. I just didn't buy that because the New Testament doesn't seem to allow that to work because the New Testament assumes that there is going to be some level of coercive conscience binding authority in the hands of those who rule over the flock and I, I just think it gets trivialized when people can just discern for themselves which pastors they're going to serve under um, and then go from you know go from two or three different London Baptist Confession of Faith Reformed Baptist churches at, at, to another and you know the pastors excommunicate each other and you know they're having an issue on um you know who's legitimately receiving excommunicates who's legitimately pardoning those who were formally excommunicated it just it, it you know who has the authority to decide in these matters um there's no there's no uh, uh comfortable admission that they are trying to be a sola scripturist while also trying to uphold the New Testament principle of authority in the elders. And it's not always easy to uphold those things. It, 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 it's very, um, it's like nailing jello to a wall. It's, sometimes it's really hard to get something clear out of that. It's hard to see coherence there. So I just, me being me, I went into history. I read a number of books. I, I went through, um, one book by a, a German scholar, his name is Hans von Kump, Kumpenhausen. Um, the title of that book is Ecclesiastical Authority and Spiritual Power in the Church of the First Three Centuries. And I learned that um, the early church did practice church discipline. And it was not anywhere comparable to what I saw happening in 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 the in the contemporary evangelical world where you've got discipline but um you know you can separate and go to another church and you know just agree to disagree and then another pastor uses the keys to sort of open the key open the kingdom of heaven back to somebody who was formally excommunicated somewhere else that's certainly <clears throat> that's certainly not how it was done you had to uh, prove that you were in good standing with your bishop. Uh, if you were going to leave one church and go to another, they'd give you a certificate showing that you were in good standing with the church. If you were disciplined and you wanted to go to church somewhere else, therefore you couldn't because you didn't have a certificate. You didn't have uh, letters of recommendation to show that your bishop um, you know, validates that you're in good standing with the church. And in, in fact, in order for somebody to come back to communion with the church, they'd have to go through a rigorous schedule of penance where they would slowly go from the outside and work their way back into the church. So they would be those who would stand, those who would hear, those who would kneel, and then eventually you'd be brought back into the sanctuary for the liturgy of the Eucharist and the liturgy of the word and i continue to read i read uh this is a zondervan book uh church history by john woodbridge and he described the same thing that the early christian churches were doing that as well and uh another one is by rst hazelhurst some some accounts of the penitential discipline of the early church in the first four centuries I'll put the link for these books. You could actually uh, get some of them for free um, to get a, a, you know, 
a look into how the early church of the first five centuries practiced church discipline. The last one is Nathaniel Marshall, the penitential discipline of the primitive church of the first 400 years. And what I got from this was this local Reformed Baptist church was doing something right because they're doing exactly what these early Christians were doing and not just were doing, you know, in this little corner of the church, but this was the, the tradition of the church east, west, north, and south. Um, everybody, everybody knew that the local church had the authority to coercively bind the conscience of the members of the church and that um, those who wielded such authority were uh, they understood themselves to be enthroned. They sat in the chair of ecclesiastical of of the ecclesiastical disciplinarian. So they knew that <coughs> they knew that um, they could issue judgments over a person's soul, and that those judgments would be uh, uh, coercively binding. But to get that across today, when while you're teaching that, you know, you're, you're, you're adducing points from the New Testament that teach that the uh, elders of a church have to do that. But then the next Sunday, you come out and say that, you know, the only infallible rule is Scripture. And so everything else we're doing here that's not directly evidenced by Scripture is fallible, could be wrong. Well... Um, that, that could be, you know, that opens up chaos. And obviously in the, in the reform world, you see this and I saw it firsthand. And so that's the next stage of my development where I began to realize this tension of, you know, focusing only on the scripture as the, the soul, um, the soul unquestionable infallible rule of faith so that's another book if you want to get a, a good understanding of what the reform people uh, believe it's called god's word alone by matthew barrett um to understand uh you know historical definition and defense of sola scriptura but um i came to see that uh it runs up and conflicts with the new testament the New Testament that dresses the subgroup of the local community, the elders, with the authority to use discernment and to effect decisions, um, disciplinary decisions, um, decisions concerning doctrine, that they understood, that they understood sort of, um, it disallowed the sheep from using their own discernment from the scripture to then go find another environment where they're more agreeable to. I hope that makes sense. Um, and one book I read that uh, I'll add to the list of the other ones, but I have this one physically here. It's called Those Who Must Give an Account. This was written by Protestants. And uh, one particular chapter in here... Uh, Let's see, uh, by, by uh, uh, Thomas Schreiner and um, Andrew Davis, Nathan Fenn, Mark Dever. Um, you'll get uh, a historical survey of church discipline in the early church, but also in the historic Baptist churches um, of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Um, and they were, they were far more in line with the Reformed Baptist Church I was attending, which got a bad reputation for being heavy-handed um, in comparison to other Reformed Baptist churches that seemed to be very light. Um, and, and, and so I, 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 I began to grow aware of this, this deep inconsistency that I was seeing. And it led me to question, what is the locus of validation when it comes to authority. What is the source of authority? 
Imagine if I, you know, was sitting on the side of the road in my car and I saw a car drive by at like 100 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour lane. And I quickly catch notice of it. I get on the road and I start chasing him down. I put a siren on the top of my car and I pull him over and I say, sir, you've been speeding 50 miles an hour over the speed limit and you've broken the law. This is the penalty. You have to pay this much money for this ticket that I'm going to write out and I'll go take this to the local court or city hall and, and, and you make sure that you uh, fix your driving habits. What's wrong with that story? Well, the, what's wrong with that story is I'm not a police officer. I've not been deputized to go out there and to, you know, effectively and, you know, conscience-bindingly discipline and enforce the law. And so I might know the law very well. Let's say I know it better than 99.9% .9 of, of, of the, you know, the police departments in my city and even the, the justices of my city. That still doesn't give me the right to go out there and start pulling people over and, you know, arresting people and, and uh, you know, enforcing the law. People are bound to ask me, where's your badge? What's your badge number? Because we know just in the normal course of the world that there has to be a locus of validation when it comes to running a visible institution that has authority, which, as I said, the, the, the Reformed Baptist Church was recognizing. The New Testament eldership is, a, is adorned. It's dressed up in authority by the words of Scripture itself. But what validates that? Is it just really knowing the law very well? Is it being a genius in the civil code of your land? No. You have to go through the process of being legitimately validated, legitimately authorized by a certain, by a certain source. And that source is then unquestioned. There is nothing there is nothing to question that source. Everyone knows and recognizes that that's the the locus of, of, of where the law and its legitimacy in terms of legislation and um, enforcement comes from. So uh, I, I got the hint that the local Reform Baptist Church I was going to, they did precisely that. They went somewhere to school you know, one or more persons. They learned a lot about the Bible and they thought they can, you know, I really know a lot about the Lord. I have a deep desire to go into the ministry and I'm going to go into the ministry. And you start inviting people over to your church or wherever, you know, maybe you might be starting off in your garage or renting a, a, an elementary school, cafeteria, whatever it is. And then you just, you know, you, you assume that the offices of authority in the New Testament apply to you and you could start enforcing the law. And this is what opened me up to the whole concept that I was learning from reading the early church of apostolic succession. And I began to realize, wow, this isn't just what is taught in the early church. This is also very logical. It also makes perfect sense that you would have this kind of a structure to the visible church, which gets into this issue of the visible church and apostolic succession within the Protestant world, because the Protestants definitely do teach um, that the, the church is visible in some sense. But their understanding of the visible church is different than the Catholic church's understanding of the visible church. If I told you that, well, you know, I'm going to pull you over because I know the law really well and uh, I know exactly what the penalty is and you deserve it. So therefore, boom, you got it. All the person is going to say, well, I can't see you. You're invisible. Well, of course not. I'm visible. I'm here. You know, I pulled you over. Everybody can see that I pulled you over. That's not what we mean in the Catholic Church by visibility when it comes to the church. What we mean is, okay, here's my badge number. My badge number is, you know, 
um, you know, 62134, and I'm deputized under Sheriff so-and-so, who in turn is deputized by the larger tier until you get to the tiers of authority that um, serve as a locus of where things begin, the arche or the source that legitimizes, legit, the, 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 that makes legitimate all the badges in the city, that, that makes legitimate all the sheriff departments in the city. So there's this source of validation. And so that's what the early church believed when it came to ch local church plants. You know, a bishop had to be six, he had to be in an unbroken succession of ordination back to the apostles, which is the locus of authority. Christ breathing on the apostles is the locus of authority. And those who come in unbroken succession from the apostles then have a criteria and a principle whereby to validate their badge number. You know, now you might have corrupt cops, you know, that doesn't mean that the whole concept and the whole theory of hierarchy and validation, you know, official validation is out the window. So it's the same, you know, you can't just know a lot about God. You can't just have a really good prayer life, have a zeal for souls and go out there and start preaching and baptizing and communing and confirming and anything like that. You need to go to uh, the hierarchical locus of authority that continues, okay, the, the locus, the, the origin, the arche, or the, the, um, the principle, the originating principle is Christ. He breathed on the apostles, then the apostles ordained others, laid hands on them. And after that, there you have this uh, transmission of, you know, uh, priestly orders through the laying on of hands. And the early church understood that this was indispensable, absolutely indispensable. And so that made me realize that as a Reformed Baptist, I might have some rethinking to do. But I didn't leave yet. I wasn't anywhere close to leaving. I... I I had all the normal objections still to that, that a Reformed Baptist would have. But um, I will uh, stop there, and um, we'll, we'll move on to the third part uh, probably in a few days. But I kind of wanted to, you know, show people what I was experiencing as a Reformed Baptist, seeing the inconsistencies of Sola Scriptura, and yet the scriptura uh, equipping the leaders with authority and you know how that's supposed to work under the auspices of sola scriptura um, and how that can become tense especially when validation sources are missing uh, especially when there's hierarchical accountability that's completely absent um, things can run into chaos very quickly and people are consequently confused and authority itself becomes more trivialized and and so people end up putting more stock in their own investigation and their own conclusions of things and obviously that's that's the uh you know it's the weakness and the forte um of of protestantism before i completely end um i want to recommend some books because as a reformed baptist i started to study history like i said a few things came to to, to that came on my table that um you know slowly changed my mind so it, it inevitably led me to understand that uh infants were baptized in the early church and that there was a tradition um, of this going back to the early church and these are the two books that I read by Jehoiakim Jeremias. Um, this one's called The Origins of Infant Baptism. And uh, I read the second one that he wrote in response to Kurt Alon called Infant Baptism in the First Four Centuries. That got me thinking. And I didn't, I wasn't convinced right away after I read that, but those two books really informed me on the historicity and the, um, the apostolicity of uh, infant baptism. 
if those of you who want to know what the best book to understand the Catholic doctrine of justification, I, you know, I had expressed my issues with the Reformed doctrine. Uh, well, I now hold to the Catholic position, and anybody who wants to know what the best book out there to get on this issue, if you're a Protestant or a Catholic, is definitely Robert Sungenis, Not by Faith Alone. Just read the whole thing, take a lot of notes. I, I guarantee you it's convincing. The best commentary on Romans I could recommend is Thomas Aquinas. This is uh, published by Emmaus Publishing, or Emmaus Academic, uh, translated by Father Fabian Larcher, uh, Dominican priest and scholar. Uh, Thomas Aquinas has got the best commentary on Romans. I can't, I can't find a better one. I used to love Douglas Moo, Cranfield, um, all the typical ones, Stolmucker, um, Leon Morris, uh, Colin Cruz. You've got a lot out there. But um, I just, his commentary, his commentary and, pop, and probably St. John Chrysostom. But if you're a Protestant, you want to understand how to get through Romans 4 and, you know, the, the workless, gratuitous justification uh, of Abraham and all those texts, get this book. Um, for those wanting to, to read a more balanced um, account of justification from a reform uh, perspective, um, Brian J. Vickers wrote a book called Paul's Theology of Imputation, Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with him many, many years ago and, um, you know, trying to work through these issues on, on justification. He was just such a gracious soul. And I think his book does, uh, if, for, for a Protestant, probably the best, um, more, the, the most fair exegesis I've seen. Obviously, I disagree with him on the issue, um, but far better than any other reform person I've seen. Um, on on that issue in the contemporary era, um, apostolic succession and the things I was talking about with the locus of authority, locus of validation, what is a church? Um, anybody who's really wants to dig deep into this um, ecclesiology and the distinctives of Catholicism versus Protestantism, I'd recommend B. C. Butler's The Idea of the Church. It's a rather old book. Um, but let me see if I can get the, yeah, here we go. I don't know if that's visible there. You can probably zoom in if you have to. The Idea of the Church by B.C. Butler, Basil Christopher Butler. Um, this book is probably the best book to teach a Protestant what it is that Catholics mean, in Orthodox really, uh, by the visibility of the church and how that is distinguished from classical reform thought on the matter. So that's all I have to recommend. And uh, we'll end there. I'll probably go on to talk about um, other issues that I ran across as a Reformed Baptist. And remember, this was a, I'm, I'm taking us around to the year 2009 now, 2010 perhaps. I'm still a Reformed Baptist. But these are all things that start to cook in my mind. So... Until next time, God bless. Please leave all your your criticism, comments, whatever you'd like. Um, I just ask that you would do unto others um, as you would have done unto yourself. God bless you.